All right, well, let's go ahead and kick things on off. Uh, maybe folks will, I think folks are still kind of trickling in, um, but we're gonna do a little front matter here uh, at the beginning, um, and then everything will be recorded, which I think everyone should kind of be notified of here. Uh, so I'm sure uh, a bunch of folks will catch, uh, catch the beginning later, or maybe the whole thing. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Ryan Davis. I'm the Pennsylvania Forest Projects Manager uh, with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. I'm based out of our Lancaster PA office. Um, and um, welcome to our 2021 Sportsman's Forum. So how we're uh, uh, organizing it this year, this is our fourth year, I think, our fourth Sportsman's Forum um, total. Uh, usually, you know, obviously we're kind of getting it all together uh, in one place, doing a bunch of presentations, a bunch of discussions, breakout groups, that kind of thing. Um, but we decided that this would be kind of a cool way to structure things. It's sort of the, the whole point of the Sportsman's Forum it's kind of bringing together a lot of the sort of grassroots conservationists, which are, you know, sporting groups, uh, for folks who are really kind of focused on uh, uh, the, the game and fish species that we like to pursue, um, and then connecting them with all the other kind of environmental folks who are around there, also working on pretty much doing the exact same thing, but we don't always kind of talk to each other and work together. Um, uh, so yeah, it's been a really cool experience over these last couple of years to be able to offer these, and how we're breaking it out now is instead of kind of having a bunch of different sessions on a bunch of different things. We're kind of breaking it out by um, by species or, or sort of, you know, category. Uh, we had waterfowl last week, you know, including a bunch of different species, obviously. Uh, and this week we're focusing on one, uh, the great wild turkey, Meliagra scale of Pavo. Uh, and then we will do brook trout next week. Um, and then the final week uh, will be white-tailed deer, um, nice and controversial. So uh, right in time, I think, for a lot of folks to really get out there, although it's, it, the rut is just about here um, in PA. Um, so, uh, yeah, we let's get on into it. Um, real quick, the Alliance, uh, kind of who we are, what do we do, why are we doing you know, the Sportsman's Forum thing here. Um, this is our 50th year. We've been around since pretty much that early, you know, uh, uh, environmental movement um, in the 70s and, and 60s. So that kind of resulted in the Clean Water Act and a lot more attention on this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, really, our, our mission is simple, is restore the Chesapeake Bay. Um, obviously, there's a lot more you can do when you're up in the watershed. What we kind of have been kicking around lately, which I really like, is upstream solutions to downstream problems. Um, if we can restore habitat and a stream riparian zone uh, up here in PA, uh, in, in my office here, um, it's going to impact the bay, but it's going to impact up here as well. So that's kind of how we like to work. Uh, so I'm based out of that Lancaster PA office. We also have an office in D.C., Annapolis, Maryland, um, and Richmond, Virginia. And Jenna Mackley is, is holding it down in New York for us, a little bit outside the watershed, right outside the Finger Lakes. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, we have kind of four pillars of our work. I am our forest projects manager, so I do a lot of reforestation, um, which really ties in directly uh, to the habitat work that we're going to hear about a lot today. Um, but so does a lot of our other stuff. Uh, our other kind of three pillars are green infrastructure, uh, agriculture, and then stewardship and engagement. Um, you know, those first three are kind of, you know, direct uh, management practices to kind of improve things. So you might be kind of wondering why the stewardship and engagement. Well, there's 18 million people in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and we kind of need all of them to be, uh, you know, on, on board and, and on our side uh, with all this stuff. Uh, conservation is kind of death by a million cuts, and so we got to get all those million cuts, you know, sutured up. So uh, getting everybody involved um, and active and engaged in this is, is critical uh, to restoring the bay and, and any other natural resource. Um, so yeah, let's get it started here. Um, we have two fantastic speakers today. Um, first is going to go where it will start south and move north. Um, so Bob Long is a wild turkey upland game bird project manager um, for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources uh, in the Wildlife and Heritage Service. Um, and then Mary Jo Castellana is the wild turkey biologist with Pennsylvania Game Commission. Um, so without further ado, uh, Bob, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen if you want to jump on there with yours and we'll kick it off. So thanks everybody. And uh, oh, some kind of front matter. Um, if you wouldn't mind keeping muted here uh, as, as our speakers are talking. And then if you have any questions, we'll circle back to them later. If you just want to go ahead and put them in the chat for now, park them in the chat um, and then we'll discuss later. All right, thanks. All your Bob. Okay, so I will try to share my screen here. Make sure this technology is working correctly. Can you see that? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, so um, so thanks, Ryan. And uh, I kick it off with some information about turkeys in Maryland. Uh, just kind of a kind of a hodgepodge of um, 
you know, introductory information, uh, some population status info, and a little bit of habitat stuff thrown in there, which, uh, which Ryan alluded to. Um, so let's see. So yeah, like Ryan said, talking about Eastern wild turkey. So uh, there's five subspecies of wild turkeys in North America. And uh, we're talking about the Eastern wild turkeys, which is in blue there. And it's uh, gonna be this, the subspecies that Mary Jo has in Pennsylvania as well. That's the most widespread and common wild turkey in North America. And so I think it's worth telling the story of the wild turkey Again, you know, you've probably heard it, um, and, and really this isn't just Maryland's history of, of turkeys. It, it really probably is very similar to most states and, uh, you know, across the country that have uh, brought turkeys back really from the brink of extinction. But, you know, there's so much negative, and, you know, Ryan and I were just talking about bobwhite quail and rough grouse, and, you know, there's a lot of species that aren't doing real well, and a lot of uh, endangered uh plants and animals right now. And, you know, so it's, it's good that we have a success story. Uh, and so we kind of take a step in, back in time, look at pre-settlement times, turkeys were very abundant based on all the, the uh, reports that, that, you, that you read from that period of time. But like most things, you know, we kind of messed things up and uh, went through a period of exploitation with unregulated hunting and extensive timber clearing. Uh, you know, now things have kind of reversed and sometimes managing your forest and cutting some trees can be a good thing for some, some wildlife species. Uh, but back then there was uh, extensive timber clearing, really eliminated all the turkey habitat. And that drove turkeys to near extinction. In, in Maryland uh, specifically, we only had a few hundred birds, maybe a thousand birds left uh, in, in the early part of the 1900. So, you know, at some point, conservationists and the game and the game agencies said, we need to do something. So let's close the hunting season. They tried that for a couple of decades. That didn't work because they were already gone. Uh, so they said, well, we can raise turkeys in pens and release them. So that's what they did. They tried that for about 40 years with uh, very little success. It was a dismal failure. Those birds just didn't know how to reproduce. Uh, raise young, uh, you know, forage, they, they just, it just was a failure. So even as recently as 1970, turkeys were restricted in Maryland to just those western couple counties and really like the high elevation areas where, um, you know, they were, uh, you know, so, sort of the inaccessible areas where, where folks couldn't really get to them. In the 1970s or the early 70s through the about, through about 2000 was the period of turkey restoration in Maryland. The uh, timing might be a little bit different. I think Pennsylvania got a little earlier start on it than we did. But the uh, advent of this, this uh, turkey rocket net uh, or this, this rocket net technology allowed biologists and managers to capture turkeys where they still existed and move them to unoccupied habitat. And that's really the um, mechanism that allowed turkeys to be moved around the state, you know, true wild turkeys. These weren't uh, birds that were raised in a pen, uh, kind of put them back into, the, into places where they should have, uh, where they originally were. And they did their thing and their range expanded and uh, population grew. So here's an estimate of our statewide turkey population. Like I said, we went from a few hundred birds uh, in the 1970s, and uh, we've got over 40,000 wild turkeys now, and they're in every county and doing quite well. So it's a real conservation success story, and I think it's worth worth pointing that out. That you know sometimes we we do get things right and uh, have some success with wildlife. Okay, so let's look at some of the more recent population trends. Um, and, and dig a little bit deeper into that. So here in Maryland, we have some areas where those, uh, those populations are still doing really well and increasing. Uh, and it's interestingly enough, it's mainly in this suburban corridor, uh, sort of the, 
you know, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., uh, stretching down to the Potomac River. You know, that's the area where turkeys were kind of just kind of stagnant for a while. There was some birds in all these counties, uh, say, 20 or 30 years ago. They were there, but rarely seen and, and definitely not really in, in, uh, uh, in abundance in those counties. And in the last 10 years or so, those populations there have really exploded and have taken off. I, I don't know if the birds are adapting to that environment or exactly why that is, but they're doing really well there. Uh, same can't be said for some of our other parts of the state. Uh, Western region is fairly stable. Uh, they have, they've had turkeys for quite a while and they're still kind of chugging along. Uh, the Eastern shore is where we ha do have some concerns. So we, we list them still as a stable population, uh, but there are pockets here on the Eastern shore where we traditionally had a lot of birds that have declined, you know, 30, maybe 40%. And uh, we're starting to kind of question what might be happening there and uh, what has changed over the last 10 or, or so years. So I think Mary Jo is gonna mention some of the the research, upcoming research that uh, they're gonna kick off and we're pro we will probably join that effort to investigate some of those declines. Um, we're kind of curious to see what's going on there. So if you look at where, where turkeys are most abundant in Maryland, um, the darker the color, the, and this is just an index based on the, the wild turkey harvest, which is a, a pretty good index of you know, how many birds are there relative to other, other parts of the state. And you can see that, that even though they're still growing and expanding in that central part of the state, in general, that's where we have the fewest birds. And it's simply a habitat uh, situation there. There's just not nearly as much habitat. Uh, western and the eastern parts of the state still, you know, contain the most, the most habitat and the most, most turkeys. And like I said, habitat really drives those populations a lot of places and, and it accounts for the differences between uh, regions of the state. So we'll take a few minutes and talk about some habitat in general, and then also look at some more specific types of habitat that I think is, is often overlooked and, and, and needed uh, if you wanna maximize your turkey populations. So in general, you know, I think we all know that there, it's a bird of, of the forest, you know, it's usually found in or near forests. And, uh, you know, trees provide a lot of things for turkeys. They're safe roosting areas. They roost in trees at night. Um, also, a lot of the, the food that they eat, um, soft mast, hard mast, acorns, uh, is, is all provided with, uh, with forests. So, of course, they're, that's usually a key component of their habitat. Where things have changed in the last few decades is that you know, historically biologists, you know, maybe 50 years ago, biologists thought, well, turkeys need these vast unbroken expanses of forest, you know, um, and th that's kind of just where they, where they, the, re the remnant populations were back when our restoration efforts started, because it's it, pretty much just where people couldn't get to them. What we found since then is that it, they actually do quite well, like in today's landscape, you know, this mosaic of forest and open land that we have in Maryland and most of Pennsylvania. Now that's kind of where we see the highest density of birds is where you have sort of a 50-50 mix of forest and open land. And uh, just a common question that we get is uh, a lot of times is what, what their home range is and, you know, how, how many acres do you need to support turkeys? And, you know, it varies widely, but generally they're going to use anywhere from 400 to 2,000 acres or maybe more. Um, so, you know, it's unlikely that one property can provide their year-round you know, needs for, for habitat. So, you know, just because you don't see birds on your land in a certain season doesn't mean that they're not going to use it, uh, you know, in a, in a different part of the year or for a different purpose. So let's uh, dig into some of this more specific habitat. And, uh, you know, nesting season, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, this, so this is in the, in the late spring, early summer period. 
And we don't really see turkeys in this kind of habitat much. You know, we see them in the open forest and in fields, but an equally, if not more important type of habitat is this like thick protective cover that uh, the birds are really using it to hide their nests. Uh, there's a lot of predators that are, that are looking for, you know, both nesting turkeys and particularly their nest, you know, so you've got foxes, raccoons, possums, skunks, uh, black rat snakes, you know, the list goes on. There's a lot of things that will eat turkey eggs and the, and the hen if they can, they can catch them. Um, and the birds are nesting on the ground for 26 to 28 days. They need to find a place that's secure that they can like sort of hide that nest from those predators and hope that they don't, they don't, aren't, aren't discovered by them. So, uh, so this thick brushy kind of habitat, which we're kind of lacking on today's landscape is, is definitely important for that. Uh, low nest success is really common with turkeys and most ground nesting birds. Uh, usually only about a quarter of those nests are successful, but the better the habitat we have, the, uh, the more successful uh, the birds can nest. The same, same uh, thing can be said for the, the brood rearing habitat. So once these nests hatch, those poults are gonna be up and out of the nest within hours or you know, definitely within a day. Uh, so they're, they're what we call precocial, but they need really good habitat that has a couple key things. It needs to have that overhead protection from predators. Uh, this is the time period when avian predators can really take a toll. You got hawks, owls um, that, that can uh, key in on these, these broods. Uh, so they need that overhead protection. So oftentimes they'll use uh, old fields, uh, They'll use power lines, you know, roadsides, anywhere that's like an unmowed area that is, uh, it's, it's got that overhead cover and also insects. You know, they need that high, high protein food source. And so like these grassland and shrubland type of habitats uh, are, are really ideal. You know, areas with grass, herbaceous vegetation, what you might think of as weeds. You know, weeds are all generally pretty good for wildlife. And I really want to just, you know, let you know that like this turkey, we talk, we're talking about turkey brood habitat, but, you know, I'm, I'm a game bird biologist that deals with quail and, and a lot, some other, other animals. And, uh, and this habitat really benefits a wide range of, of critters. So you have a lot of declining non-game songbirds that are benefiting from grassland and shrubland habitat. You got the uh, northern bobwhite, who's really in trouble and uh, really uh, populations are, are getting to dangerously low levels there, uh, at, at least in Maryland. And you also have some declining populations of pollinators like bees and butterflies, and they all can benefit from this type of habitat. Just to kind of drive that point home, this is a list. Of, these, are, these are like the top, whatever, I think 15 bird species that are uh, that are declining the most it's like the, the the list you don't want to be on if you're if you're a bird and seven or eight of of those or more than that probably 10 of, of the 15 or something like that are are dependent on grassland or what we might call early successional habitat so it's that young stage of growth uh, very very important habitat that we're losing and uh we, we, we really need to put it back on the landscape. So habitat management for turkeys, in, uh, turkeys specifically, well, there's a lot of things you can do. And, and uh, you know, just, this is just kind of a quick list. I've got an hour long presentation that, you know, I sometimes give talking about habitat management for turkeys. But um, for the sake of time, we're just gonna kind of go through this real quick. You can do forest management to encourage that early successional habitat that, that I just mentioned. So thinning your forest, um, you know, providing that sunlight on the ground that's going to produce the insects and the cover that, that the birds need. You can also improve mass production by various silvicultural practices. Um, you can do tree planting. So Ryan was talking about that. Great way to, to, to uh, provide habitat, especially if you have large crop fields, a uh, lot, of, lot of open land, you know, 
do those tree plantings to provide that, that forest cover that, that turkeys need. Planting native grasses is always a great thing. You can do that in a variety of situations, you know, what we might call a field border, filter strip or a buffer, you know, something that has that dual, you know, water quality and wildlife habitat benefit. Uh, there's a great things to do. It's not really going to help your turkey population out, as well as a lot of these other animals. I list food plots last because honestly, most of the uh, turkeys aren't typically limited by food, but it's something that a lot of landowners do want to do just to provide, you know, something that they, quick and easy that they can put out there and, um, and give those birds. And I really want to stress that a lot of these practices that you can do you can get technical and financial assistance through these USDA Farm Bill programs. And, um, you know, the NRCS offices can really help you out, get you set up and make it pretty painless to enroll your land in these, these practices. And it's like a win-win for landowners. Okay, so as far as population management of turkeys, we talked a little bit about habitat management. You know, we have the goals to ensure that healthy turkey populations are maintained statewide. We do that with population monitoring and habitat management. And then beyond that, we want to make sure that high quality hunting opportunities uh, exist, you know, when that population can support it. One of the important monitoring uh, tools that we use is the Summer Wild Turkey Observation Survey. If anybody's interested in helping out with this, uh, just give me a, uh, shoot me an email afterwards. It's a, it's a volunteer-based survey. This year we had about 700 and, and a little over 700 volunteers help out with this. It's really simple. It's just the months of July and August. Just write down, you see turkeys and how old they are, um, you know, whether they're adults or young and whether they're hens or gobblers. So it's really simple, but we get a lot of really cool information been doing it since 1993, so it's a really good long-term data set, and, um, and we're learning a lot. So you notice this, this is the average number of poults observed per hen, which is a very good index of how good the, that year, specific year was for reproduction. And, uh, that, you know, the turkeys, there's a fairly high mortality rate on turkeys annually, so they need to produce birds to replace those, those birds that have that have died throughout that year. If you don't, your population is going to go going to go downhill. Uh, just sort of basic, you know, wildlife population ecology. Um, so we're always looking to have good hatches. You might say, you know, good good years for reproduction. And you can see some some not so good things here. In general, that pop that trend that uh, number of poults produced is going down through time. That's a little bit concerning. You know, we're wondering what's going on there. Um, have some ideas, but we, we, we don't know exactly. Uh, so, but some other things kind of pop out too. Uh, something that I thought was really neat this year that we found out with this survey is, you know, I, I started this job in 2002, so I've been here a while. Well, in 2004, we had a this really big spike in, in uh, turkey production. That was a year that the brood X cicadas emerged. Uh, the, la the last year. So I've been kind of waiting 17 years, uh, you know, sort of on the edge of my seat to see if we saw an increase again. And sure enough, we, we saw a pretty good increase this year um, with it when the cicadas emerged again. Wasn't quite as high. Things have changed. You know, habitats changed. Predator communities have changed. But it still was the highest that we've had since, uh, since about 2015. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. And uh, it seems like those turkeys are taking advantage of those um, high protein cicadas when, they, when they're available and probably growing a little faster and, and a little stronger and able to avoid predation. So pretty neat. So I mentioned our turkey hunting seasons. Uh, we've got a five week season that begins April 18th. It's our spring season, by far and away our most popular season. A lot of folks like to hunt in the spring. Uh, weekend before that is our junior hunt days and hunt Sundays, some Sundays in Maryland. Uh, but check the hunting guide because it's all over the board. Different counties, uh, you know, have different regulations with Sunday hunting and uh, private public land can be different. So make sure you check the guide before you go on a Sunday. 
Bag limits, one bearded bird per day or two per season. Hunting hours close at noon the first three weeks and sunset the last two weeks. Here's our uh, spring turkey season harvest and uh, have about 10,000 spring hunters. Last few years, the harvest has been around 4,000 uh, 4, birds uh, for about a 25 to 30% success rate. We also have a fall turkey season. This is limited to three counties only though. It's our Western three counties. It's kind of our traditional fall hunted area, nine day season, and uh, it's a one bird bag limit uh, combined with the, with the winter season, which I'll talk about in a minute. Got the automatic light that goes off. So our fall turkey season is not nearly as popular as our spring. We only have about 1,500 fall hunters, success rate of around 10%. Now this popularity in this season has declined over time. I don't know if they're too busy chasing big bucks or what, but, um, but, but it definitely has gone down. But there's still a, a good number of folks that like to get out there at, get uh, uh, after them in the fall season. And we have a fairly recent winter turkey season. This is a statewide season. And uh, it was established in 2015 kind of as a way to allow that, that fall style of hunting uh, at a time where there wasn't a lot of other seasons you know, ongoing. It wasn't complicated with, with deer seasons and, and things like that. So it's three days in mid-January. If you did not take a bird in the fall, you got a one bird bag limit. And uh, about 1,500 hunters take six, 60 to 110 turkeys annually. So there's pretty ample opportunity to get out there and get a turkey in Maryland. Uh, spring, spring season's definitely most popular, but there are some other opportunities. And just my last little PSA, um, we do have an increased number of, you know, sort of, I hate to say it, but nuisance turkey situations where uh, turkeys cause problems in these suburban areas. Almost always it can be traced back to somebody feeding these birds and, and, and be, they've become habituated to humans, kind of lost that, that uh, fear and uh, you know, they end up chasing the mailman or the kid at the school, the school bus. And uh, uh, just like to remind people to keep the wild and wild turkeys and don't feed them. And with that, hopefully I didn't go too much over and take any questions if it's appropriate. Wonderful, thanks Bob, that was great. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's see here. Let's go ahead and Mary Jo, if you're ready, um, let's go ahead and pass it to you and then we'll kind of circle back and, and do questions later if that's good. Keep the flow going. But thanks Bob, okay. appreciate it. Thanks Bob, that was really interesting. Yeah, so let me, um, so thanks, everybody for uh, for viewing in. Thanks, Ryan, for for inviting me and uh, inviting both of us. Let's see, let me turn this. Uh, can you all see my screen? Looks great. Okay, so um, yeah, so Bob talked a lot about the history of, of wild turkeys and, uh, and, and, you know, and the, the management, uh, the Maryland management uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, you know, Pennsylvania wild turkey management um, and then go into a little bit about research like, like Bob had hinted. Um, so our, you know, our, our, our spring season is real similar to, to Maryland, um, but we have, you know, of course we have more turkey hunters. We're a bigger state. Uh, you know, we have about 200,000 spring turkey hunters and about um, just about a hundred, a little, little less than a hundred um, thousand fall turkey hunters. So a little bit uh, difference in that, you know, because of the, the number of turkey hunters we have in Pennsylvania, we have to be quite conservative with our hunting season regulations. Um, so let me go in here a little bit and show you, you know, that our, just like in Maryland, you know, our turkey population really increased dramatically with the trap and transfer. Uh, we, we never completely lost all of our turkeys in Pennsylvania, uh, but we only had about oh, an estimate of 20 to 30,000 uh, left in the state um, uh, by the turn of the, you know, into the uh, 
to the 1900s. So, but if you look at, you know, from around 1995 to about 2001, we, we really were, um, yeah, this population was expanding ex exponentially. And uh, our, our population peaked at about 280,000 turkeys in um, around 2001. But at, since then, um, since, since about 2003, uh, 2003 is when uh, we, when we finished our trap and transfer, uh, we only had, we pretty much finished trap and transfer a little bit before 2000, but then from 2000, um, 2001 to 2003, we opened up trap and transfer again into the southeastern part of the state. And, um, and then right after, you know, the trap and transfer was completely finalized, we saw some uh, major population declines and and then we just you know the population started to ebb and flow a lot but now we're really you know we've we've seen that the population hasn't been um increasing at all really much much at all we really would rather have our our population at about you know closer to 250,000 uh, throughout the state so our current turkey population is is below goal and um and so you know, why, why have we been seeing uh, those turkey population declines? And we really figure there's about five, five factors that affect turkey populations. One, of course, is habitat. Um, but these, but let me back up a little bit. These five factors have really um, changed dramatic, changed a lot during the last 20 years. And so if you look at these five factors, and actually the interactions of these five factors, that really kind of gives you an idea of why turkey populations have been declining. So when I talk about habitat, uh, I really mean, you know, large scale um, habitat uh, declines, Lar large scale, qual you know, the quality of large scale um, habitat. So, you know, we've seen that decline. Weather patterns are changing especially during the spring when uh, turkeys are nesting, as Bob talked about, you know, turkeys nest on the ground. Um, you know, they need, they need good habitat to protect them from adverse weather. And we see a lot more rain events um, during the spring and that's affecting, um, that's, that's, that's affecting nest success. Of course, you have natural predators, but we also have seen an increase in a, not only abundance of, of natural predators, but also um, an increased amount of uh, diversity. You know, there's more species of, of predators, especially in Pennsylvania, where you know we've reintroduced um, you know several different species predator species, and then of course harvest. Uh, and this, but, but mostly it's the fall harvest. We really, we, we feel that we have our spring season um, regulated well, but it, the fall harvest, when you can harvest either a male or a female, then if you take out too many hens, especially during, um, during falls after a uh, poor reproductive year, then, you know, you're really dipping into your reproductive success for the next year. And then finally, disease. And that's a big question mark. Uh, you know, we, we know that there's a lot of new diseases on the landscape and, um, and you know, it, it, new diseases to Pennsylvania, to, to North America, as a matter of fact. And so what effect is that having on, on turkeys? And that's a, that's a big unknown right now. Um, so when we look at you know, our turkey population declines, what, what we really do is um, we look at what we call spring harvest density. And that's the, um, the spring harvest per square mile of uh, wildlife management unit. And as you can see in this graph, these are, uh, what, um, Pennsylvania is, um, is broken into 23 different wildlife management units, as you see here. And, uh, and so we look at the spring harvest density trend in, in each of these units. And you can see here that the spring harvest density trend is below goal in 15 of our wildlife management units, um, as you can see in the red. So, you know, so that's a, 
definitely a concern for us. Um, excuse me, my dog has uh, come inside and now she is wanting me to play with her. So if you see an ear, uh, a, a dog ear, that, that's my dog, sorry about that. <laughs> so what have we done regarding the, um, the fact that we have spring harvest densities that are below goal in 15 wildlife management units? Well, um, for the fall of 2021, we actually have shorter hunting season lengths in 15 of our wildlife management units shown here with the, the, the arrows. Um, so all of these units, we, we are expecting to have uh, a smaller fall harvest because, uh, because the, the season length is shorter, but we also uh, starting this year, and if anybody is a turkey hunter in Pennsylvania um, this year, keep in mind that rifles have been eliminated as a firearm for, for fall turkey, turkey hunting. Other things that we have done is of course, you know, improve turkey habitat. We have over 1.5 million acres of state game lands. And so we've been really ramping up our large scale habitat improvements, especially with prescribed fire and um, a lot of much, much more intense um, uh, timber harvest, which, uh, which of course we do um, with wildlife in mind. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we monitor the populations. Again, the fall seasons, we, we are maintaining uh, even more conservative fall seasons than in the past with, uh, you know, with this large scale um, shortening of, of these seasons, as you can see on this graph. And then of course, as I said before, so our spring, se spring gobbler season the reason why we don't think that really affects our uh, turkey population is because the season starts after most of the breeding has occurred and um, when females are incubating. And so females are, um, you know, are protected from accidental harvest and they're also uh, not going to be disturbed as much by hunters or by people out in the woods because um, they're busy nesting, they're busy incubating their nest. <clears throat> now, so we have, we, we used to have, uh, you know, over 250,000 fall turkey hunters in the state. And the number of turkey hunters has declined, you know, to about a little under 100,000. Well, this, this past year was about 100,000 turkey hunters. Uh, so we did a study from 2011 to 2014 to look at fall season harvest and to determine if, you know, because we're losing fall hunters, does that fall season, the, does the length of the fall season still affect uh, hen harvest? Because, you know, as I said, you can harvest either a male or a female. Well, yes, in fact, we found out from, from this study that um, the, the length of the season, by, by reducing or increasing the fall season by one week, we can actually increase or decrease um, hen harvest rates. And that one week um, season can have an impact, and that one week change in the season length can have an impact. As you can see on this graph, three week season length always had um, a higher hen harvest rate during the study. And um, but so that's why we went ahead and, and you know, we reduced the fall season length in those 15 management units uh, this, this year. But um, because of, you know, the fact that turkey population tr trends are, are really, you know, trending downward, uh, that our board of commissioners wanted to have another um, avenue for decreasing the fall harvest. And so we were asked to look at um, the use of, of rifles and if eliminating rifles could reduce fall harvest as well. And so what we did here was we looked at um, on, on average, the uh, percent of harvest that uh, by implement. And we saw that you know, hunt and hunter use of implement, um, the, let's see, I guess I should say hunter use for shotguns and for bows um, exceeds the, the harvest of that from, from that implement. Whereas with rifles, it's the opposite. 
So there, you know, on average, there's about 14% of our fall turkey hunters that use rifles, but 33% of the harvest is taken with rifles. So obviously, you know, they're the most efficient method. And so we decided that, okay, um, you know, if we, if we eliminate the use of rifles, then we can really reduce uh, the fall harvest. However, then, you know, I looked at, well, what, it, you know, what does that mean by wildlife management unit? And so I looked at the um, three-year average um, percent of the fall season harvest by rifle for each of our wildlife management units. And you can see on this graph, uh, management units 1A, 1B, and 2A in, the, in Western Pennsylvania, um, the, the, harvest, the harvest by rifles is only about 20 to 25%. Rifles became legal in that area um, only about uh, 2012. So, so that's probably um, that reason. But if you look up in the north central part of the state in management units 2H and 3A, uh, nearly 45 to 50% of the harvest uh, is by rifles. So, sim so, you know, eliminating rifles will decrease the harvest, but that harvest reduction will vary greatly by wildlife management unit. And um, just to note, uh, management unit 2B uh, around the Pittsburgh area, rifles are not uh, allowed. Management units 5C and 5D in southeastern Pennsylvania are closed to fall turkey hunting. So uh, then we also looked at, well, you know, if we did eliminate the use of rifles, would we have hunter support? So we looked at from a, uh, my 2020 turkey hunter survey, we looked at hunter support uh, for different uh, sporting arms and that varied by sporting arms. So if you, for example, if you look at the uh, support for crossbows, you can see that um, the, the blue, the dark blue and the light blue are um, the percentage of hunters that uh, support crossbows. So the majority of hunters do support crossbows. However, if you look at um, the opinions of hunters that, um, well, hunters' opinions regarding rifles, it's pretty much split. Um, if you look at the, you know, the, the darker blue um, pie and the, the, and the darker red are, you know, strong support for and then strong opposition against um, uh, the use of rifles. If you looked at, you know, total support and total opposition, they're pr relatively um, similar. And then about 22% uh, of the hunters were neutral. So, um, oh, we'll back up here. So um, given that, you know, the hunter support and opposition regarding rifles was pretty much equal, then our board of commissioners decided that yes, they would in fact eliminate rifles for, um, for fall season and, um, and see if that <clears throat> elimination of the rifles can, can help to increase turkey population trends. Um, they would rather do that rather than continuing to decrease um, and then eventually maybe even eliminating uh, closing fall hunting seasons altogether. <clears throat> So that's, that's all I have regarding um, our turkey management. And I thought it would be real appropriate to discuss fall harvest management, considering that in Pennsylvania, the fall season opens on Saturday. Um, but now I wanna shift a little bit to um, the big question mark about disease, as I uh, alluded to earlier. Now, um, we, we conducted a study to determine if West Nile virus affects turkey poults. And the reason why we did that was because a um, you know, closely related species, the rough grouse, uh, is highly susceptible to West Nile virus, as we saw with, uh, with this study that, uh, that we conducted here in Pennsylvania uh, several years ago. So uh, the objective of this study was you know, to determine, as I said, if turkey pults are susceptible to West Nile virus. Um, and so what we did was, we, and actually it was kind of neat, we, we did the same type of study that we did for, for rough grouse so we could have comparable results. 
So we, co we collected over 130 wild turkey eggs uh, throughout Pennsylvania, and we brought them to University of Georgia where they hatched the eggs. They inoculated um, the poults with West Nile virus, then determined the amount of infection. And uh, fortunately, which was really interesting, the uh, University of Georgia researchers determined that wild turkey poults are not highly susceptible to experimental West Nile virus infection. And, and just as importantly, they likely do not serve as a res reservoir host for mosquito transmission of um, West Nile virus <laughs> to other species. So that's really, that, that was important to me. I wanted to make sure our, our turkeys weren't infecting our, our grouse. <laughs> Um, but now we have two new studies, um, basically to get, you know, to get some more answers on why turkey populations are declining. So, and, and again, to, you know, to look at more of those five fact, more closely at those five factors that affect turkey populations. So, you know, we have, um, well, we already looked at harvest because, you know, the fall harvest length still does um, affect hen harvest rate. So, so, you know, so we've, well, so we've studied harvest. And um, so now we want to look at habitat, weather, predation, and disease. So for habitat, weather, and predation, we have um, a hen population and movement dynamic study. Uh, and then for disease, we are, we're going to look at the prevalence of various diseases. Um, on in varying landscapes. Uh, these, both of these studies are actually using the same, same turkeys. We're gonna be transmitter, putting transmitters on hens uh, from 2022, so that's starting this, this winter until 2025. And um, this, this study is in cooperation with uh, Penn State University for uh, study number one, and then University of Pennsylvania, our wildlife futures program for uh, study number two. And as you know, as Bob alluded to earlier, um, uh, Maryland DNR will begin, will will join the study in 2003. So we do have um, some graduate students that are going to be working on it at both Penn State and University of Pennsylvania. This is probably like the biggest study. This is the biggest study Pennsylvania has ever done, and um, uh, regarding wild turkeys. So there'll be four study areas in Pennsylvania. Um, Bob is still working out the, the specific, the complete specifics, but I think there'll be two study areas in Maryland. Um, these study areas are really going to represent um, not only the different landscapes, but also different turkey population densities, spring harvest densities, and spring hunter densities. For, um, for all of the, the study areas. So first we're gonna have management unit 5C, which is, <laughs> I put the arrow in the wrong place, um, 5C in Southeastern uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, that, and of course it has um, uh, the lowest turkey population densities and uh, big urban and, and industrial ag area. Management unit 3D in the Northeast part of the state, um, kind of like the Southern Poconos. Um, so we have big uh, expanses of public land, public forested land interspersed with housing developments, below average turkey and, and below average hunter densities. Then we go out into the central part of the state, um, Penn State country, uh, out to management unit 4D. And that's like in our Ridge and Valley province. So it's public land, public forested land on the ridges, and then down in the valleys, we have big industrial ag with average um, turkey uh, population densities and, and hunter densities. And then finally, uh, management unit 2D out in the Western part of the state, where we have probably some of our best turkey habitat. It has excellent interspersion of habitats as Bob had talked about before, um, have, you know, a mix of habitat is really important. Again, of course, you know, because of that, we have above average turkeys and, and hunter densities. And so, uh, you know, a couple of uh, slides about uh, the, in our objectives, 
um, for the hen population movement dynamics. Um, it's really to assess the, you know, the impacts of all of those aspects, whether um, uh, predation, um, habitat use, and, and well, I should back up, weather and, and predation and how they affect um, nesting rates, but you know by how they vary by the different landscapes within the different study areas. And then we're going to study habitat use and movements um, with these transmitter hens. Uh, for the disease, we're going to look at how prevalence of diseases vary across the different landscapes. And then effective disease actually affects hen survival, nest rates, clutch size, and, and whatnot. Um, so we're going to be putting transmitters on these birds. Um, and again, this is gonna be a hen specific study because it's really the hens that, you know, are the, um, the major players in terms of, you know, productivity. So we're going to be putting 25 transmitters um, on turkeys in each of our study areas for four years uh, in Pennsylvania and three years in Maryland. Um, and then uh, we also in Pennsylvania, I didn't mention that uh, we do we do have an existing leg banding study. And so we're going to continue leg banding males in all of our wildlife management across the whole, whole entire state. So um, that's all I have for, you know, for my part of the of the talk. I hope I didn't go too long so that we can open it up and and. and have a little time for uh, for some questions. Wonderful, thanks so much. Not perfect, both of you. Uh, excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, I guess, let's see. So yeah, folks, if you go ahead and if you have any questions, put them in the chat. I guess I'll kind of kick things off and maybe less of a question and more of kind of a, a, a comment on top of it. Um, Bob mentioned, um, USDA offices um, as a really great resource. And I would recommend, you know, I, I think something we kind of get tied around a lot is, you know, we're focused on this stuff and we think like game lands, state parks, state forests, like that's where habitat is, that's where we manage habitat, that's where we go to hunt. But, you know, this, this can be a part of everybody's farm, everybody's forest. Um, and those, you know, on the ground offices there, your NRCS offices, your conservation district offices, um, your, your, friendly nonprofit uh, uh, partners, um, you know, we're the folks who can maybe help you meet those objectives while also, you know, uh, uh, meeting our own objectives. Bob said the, the term win-win and like it's, you know, it's a win-win for everyone. You know, we all kind of need to get these projects done. We have some grant money we need to spend or we have our own objectives, our own metrics we're trying to get. Um, so we're trying to plant X amount of acres. And when we have landowners who say, hey, I want acres for Turkey specifically, then yeah, we can absolutely you know, accommodate that and, and everybody wins. So yeah, can't recommend doing that enough. Um, and then I guess, you know, for both of you, uh, is there a specific contact, you know, for, for either state? Um, you know, I get, oh, I know in, in PA, there are uh, uh, regional biologists who are kind of more for, you know, private land, you know, assisting landowners with uh, their objectives. Um, would you say anything else about that to add on to that, Mary Jo, kind of where to look to, who to contact there? Um, for your kind of, yeah, your private lands biologists? Yes, yeah, so each of our regions, we have six regions in Pennsylvania uh, for the Pennsylvania Game Commission and each of our regions has a private lands biologist. So I would um, definitely uh, you know, encourage folks to contact your regional game commission office um, and they can give you plenty of information. We have a, we have a lot of programs for, um, for private lands management and um, and you know we also have the hunter access program for, for private landowners if they you know if they would like to open their property up for hunting then um, you know that's that's another program that we have and you know all liability is taken off of the landowner for that but in terms of habitat work uh, you know we can help you with with habitat and we uh, we have connections with NRCS and we have a lot of, yeah, gosh, it's just, there's so much money out there uh, <laughs> uh, for private landowners. And so it's nice because sometimes you can get money from NRCS, you can get money from Game Commission. Um, you know, you can, 
you can do a lot, a lot of work. And the other aspect is, you know, you can have our biologists help you develop plans. You know, just like, just like, um, I don't know if uh, a lot of the folks know about, um, you know, our Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry, you know, they have um, forest steward, you know, forest, steward forest, well, what do they call them? Um, they have um, private lands foresters. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, yeah, service foresters, yes, thanks. <laughs> um, so just like the service foresters we have, that the game commission we have, uh, you know, private land biologists. So, uh, yeah, and you could even, uh, oh, so, so thank you, Ryan, you just put up a resource. Yeah, okay. Um, our game commission office in Harrisburg also has a large, you know, that, well, the private lands um, division is, is based in Harrisburg, but we also have them in the, in the regional offices. So we would love for you to call us. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, and so I popped it there. And so Bob, and I'm not as familiar with Maryland. So is it is similar? Is there like a private lands biologist folks can reach out to? Or are you the guy uh, if they're interested in turkey? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, I would say I'm, we're a much smaller state. Um, and I, I might be a good first contact. And uh, we kind of vary by region. So we've got some regions that have pretty good uh, private lands programs. and or we're able, you know, we've got enough staff that we can offer that that technical assistance. Um, other regions, we might just direct you to the uh, NRCS office. Um, so, you know, kind of, kind of depends. We we have a couple partner positions with NRCS offices that are that are targeted towards certain species. So, we've, in the eastern region, we have a uh, there's a working lands for wildlife program, uh, which is a USDA uh, NRCS program that is focused on bobwhite quail but you know that biologist that is hired for that he you know will install practices for a wide range of of wildlife and you know waterfowl whatever it may be so you know eastern region we've definitely got a go-to person there western region's kind of the same thing that central part of the state kind of varies by county so you know feel free to give them my uh my email or i can put it in the chat and I'll set you up with the right person. Wonderful, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a kind of pivot here. Yeah, so no questions, but I guess y'all did such a great job. Nobody had any. Um, I guess I have. You know, maybe something we can start kind of discuss. Uh, uh, I think it's fascinating. Um, you know, as an ecologist, we're kind of pulling together all these different you know uh, uh, factors and. Half the time, you know, I went to school for wildlife biology and we're kind of thinking of just like habitat, the critters that we're in, you know, looking at, you know, in particular. But then when we start to think about pathogens interacting and obviously, pat, you know, a great uh, couple years here for noting that, how much pathogens can um, impact population. Um, uh, but then insects, uh, biodiversity and, uh, and abundances too, you know, as such a major thing. And so I guess... Um, yeah, kind of, uh, kind of opening it up for discussion a little bit. Um, I guess uh, if if you had to have a couple kind of you know top sort of takeaways uh, for people um, of what they should be thinking about, you know, improving uh, the habitat on their property, and because again, thinking maybe a little bit bigger than just acorns, because that's the kind of stuff that you know we hear a lot. We want deer, we want turkeys, plants and oaks. Well, you know, yes, but you know, so yeah, I, I guess. Uh, uh, opening it up a little bit what what are kind of the your elevator pitch if you will for um for good wild turkey habitat management a little well, bit more I, I don't know it, i guess it, looking at it from a pennsylvania perspective um one of our limiting factors is is secure nesting habitat so it you know the the turkey nest photos that bob showed um create more stuff like that you know basically real good brushy habitat for um, for turkey nesting, um, if they can't successfully nest, then you know, then they're just the population is going to decrease substantially, uh, quick, very quickly. So uh, you know, they only have a three year life cycle in Pennsylvania. Basically, um, if you're a three year old turkey, you probably aren't going to see another year, uh, especially unless you're you know living somewhere where you're not going to get shot or or get eaten. Um, but uh, yeah, because sorry. 
our oldest turkeys, uh, bit leg banded turkeys were from Pittsburgh and Lancaster County, you know. <laughs> so areas were a lot of urban areas. Um, but uh, yeah, so I would say create good shrubby habitat uh, for, for nesting. Um, and then of course, brood, brood rearing habitat, you know, provide that very close to, in proximity to your nesting habitat. And then while you're at it, you know, have your oaks there too, pretty close in proximity too for your wintering uh, habitat. So as Bob mentioned, you know, they have specific habitat needs during different types, times of the year. So if you have um, all of those habitats within close proximity to each other, then they might only need that 400 acres um, for home range. If they don't, then they'll need that 2000 acres. And then that's when you have higher probability of, um, of being killed just because they're moving around all the time. Yeah, yeah, I'd kind of um, echo what some of Mary Jo said, you know, I think um, we, we need to look a little bit deeper, um, particularly with things like like forest, you know, trees are great, you know, and but but we need to start thinking beyond that and 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 not just say, well, a forest is a forest, you know, we've we've actually kind of, you know, we love our trees so much that we're, we're you know, and there's this this attitude that you shouldn't do anything to improve that forest, you know, it's just, it's just let it grow. And, and that's just nature taking its course. Well, there's a lot of history through time of disturbances in those forests, um, you know, wildfires and um, things like that, that would have created that diversity. And there would have been varying age classes and, and, and you know, different vegetation at ground level that would have provided that really good turkey nesting cover, as well as habitat for a lot of songbirds. Uh, white quail, you know, you, you you know, run down the whole list, you know, it's it's going to improve the health of um, of the the wildlife and the ecosystem in general. So, you know, carefully planning some forest management activities, whether it's you know selective harvest, you know, not just going in taking the best trees, but you know, uh, carefully looking at your landowner's objectives. That's going to you know, improve the wildlife habitat. Um, and, and, and you know, do some things that, that would, would help things, you know, and then couple that with any kind of practices to reforest areas, uh, install that grassland and shrubland habitat, like Mary Jo and, uh, was talking about, you know, that nesting, brood cover is super important. Um, it's, all, it's all good stuff and there's money available. So um, yeah, no excuse for landowners not to uh, try some things. And I really like that kind of DIY sort of approach too, coupled with, you know, getting your, you know, sort of getting your, getting things figured out, talking to a professional, but there's so much we can do just on a weekend. You don't have to sign up for a big program, get $20,000 from the feds to do something. If you can go out and just chip away at your invasives, you know, for example, if you, if you work on replacing those invasives with natives, you're going to, you're going to boost your, you know, your invertebrate populations and that's going to help out you know, in the future. Yeah. And I, I was just going to, I was going to ask about fire <laughs> as a leading question. Um, that's a, the, you know, I, I do a lot of kind of education about, you know, tree species and kind of their, their um, regeneration. Almost everything needs disturbance, you know. Um, the only thing that's, you know, constant is disturbance. Um, and we kind of, yeah, like Bob said, we've kind of set pause, you know, on the, that disturbance regime. We suppress wildfires. We, uh, we trap in remove all the beavers that would, you know, potentially be flooding, causing a lot of disturbance in our kind of low-lying areas. Um, and so, yeah, um, on that note, I guess um, we do have a, a decent, you know, fire program amongst um, state agencies in PA. And, you know, I growing up in the South and going to North Carolina State University, uh, we learned a lot about, more about fire. We did a lot of prescribed burning down there. Um, I'm not sure how things are going uh, in Maryland. So I guess could each of y'all comment on kind of the, uh, uh, prescribed fire as a tool for, you know, managing turkey uh, habitat and other habitats. Yeah, so in Pennsylvania, geez, we really have ramped up our, um, our prescribed fire. And, you know, during the spring, this past spring, we, um, we burned uh, about 100,000 acres on, on game lands. Uh, and 
that was a little bit below goal. Um, but now, you know, the fall we've been, uh, we've been able to, uh, to burn it as well. And we're looking at a goal of 150,000 acres burned a year. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I mean, we have 1.5 million acres of, of game land, so we can do that. And, uh, you know, so we've, we've put all, you know, so many of our um, game lands workers into, um, uh, you know, into the, the training for, for, um, for fire. And, you know, so we have a great staff for, for doing so. We're looking at large scale, real large scale um, burns these days. Um, it's just the, the best bang for the buck. And, you know, and, and we can, we've, we've learned a lot. Yeah, we can really, uh, you know, do a good successful burn uh, in a short amount of time. We can even do, you know, we're doing aerial burns now. I mean, we're doing, uh, we're, we're very burn happy right now. So that is good. That's what we need because we, you know, we need to, for so many years, you know, we were just putting in these, you know, two acre food plots here and, and there and, uh, you know, and, and not really impacting large scale habitat. And, you know, and while we were working on putting all these food plots in, you know, our, our forest kept aging and aging and aging. And now we're at the point where, you know, we have our, our, our forests are just way too old and they're, you know, they're stagnant. Um, so we're doing a lot more um, timber harvesting. Uh, but again, you know, our foresters work for the game commission and they're, you know, they're trained to, um, to assess it, to assess a, you know, a, a stand for wildlife. And so, you know, all of our prescriptions are geared towards wildlife improvement. So that's the nice thing, you know, it, it's not geared towards the dollar. So, um, so the gosh, there's tons of prescriptions that we put in that we're, you know, we're paying for it, where it's not, they're not commercial. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and it's, it's nice, we get, we're able to, to get some grants, uh, federal grants for, uh, for some of these, as well as be able to use our own money, because then there's other commercial cuts that, you know, that we're making money on. So it all, it kind of evens out in the long run. Um, but we're doing, you know, we're, we're, co we're cooperating with the National Wild Turkey Federation, for example, in our quail restoration area uh, at Letterkenny Army Depot um, in South Central Pennsylvania. And uh, the National Wild Turkey Federation was able to get a NIFWIF grant for us to put in, um, it was, and it's a pollinator grant. You know, so we're, we're <laughs> the Turkey Federation is putting in these, you know, this uh, native pollinator mix, um, but it's, you know, and it's, so it's good for quail, it's good for turkey, it's good for pollinators, it's good for, you know, a whole array of grassland species for, uh, for you know, for moths and butterflies and what else, you know, every, everything else under the sun, so. Uh, so that's a little bit of tidbit for game commission. I could go on and on, but Bob, I need to let you have. A yeah, chance. I mean, we've ramped things up with our burning as well. Of course, we're 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 always uh, uh, taking the back seat to Pennsylvania. Of course, you, you, you oh, got you, you got the people, you got the uh, you got the staff, but that that's all right. We're doing a good job down here on our on our public lands, um, trying to ramp up that that uh, prescribed burning. Um, have some really cool project areas on the, in the eastern region. We're a little bit um, uh, handcuffed a little bit in that central part of the state with just so many people that we can't, um, you know, it's, it's tough to get over some of that with the smoke issues and things. But eastern and western parts of the state, we're, we're um, definitely doing some good things with, with prescribed fire. I think we're in the, you know, 3,000 acre range or so, um, which, you know, is is more than we were doing 10 years ago. Excellent. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's exciting to see, you know, uh, such a kind of valuable tool, you know, used more and more here in the kind of mid-Atlantic. Um, but uh, great. Well, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, no more questions here. Y'all have any parting thoughts? Uh, I really appreciate it. 
Um, yeah, I guess, yeah. Any, any parting thoughts before we kind of cover us sort of, you know, the next couple uh, sessions and, and the sort of end matter, bookend matter here? I guess we have, uh, we have Bob's contact info there. Um, I believe we're sending out emails to participants and we'll, we'll get yours in there too, Mary Jo, your email in case anybody wants to reach you, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, just feel free. If you have any questions, um, feel free to email or call. Always available and happy to talk to hunters or landowners or whoever is interested in, in our species. Thanks for having us. Of course. Yes, of course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Ryan, did you say you were going to put my email in the chat? Is that, I couldn't. Yeah, if that's okay, okay yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. Kind of figured it out. Okay. Well, thank Wonderful. you very much. Yeah, yeah. Of, course, of course. Bob and I always love talking about turkeys. <laughs> I also love that you two are have some collaboration too, Jaina. That's uh, I don't know. It's cool. It's it's the best. Um, okay, we've known so each other a long time. <laughs> love it. Yeah. <laughs> that is why if anyone is uh, oh, you see my calendar there. It's too busy. That's the, uh, yeah. I uh, it's kind of funny. You know, I've been been in this field for a little while and. Um, there's not that many people who are jerks because we all know each other. And if you're a jerk long enough, you, you, people don't want to have to do with you. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, on that sunny note. Uh, <laughs> um, so the next couple of sessions here that we have for this sportsman's forum, we have brook trout uh, next week uh, and then white tailed deer, those, uh, those uh, four letter, four legged words there um, uh, as our, our kind of ultimate um session um and then if if you want to kind of tag on for more uh things we have our watershed forum which this is kind of um one of our many kind of mini forums that we do that's kind of a spin-off from the big watershed forum that's kind of all about bringing people together around the whole watershed to, to discuss everything that we're doing drive things forward further kind of help each other out um and, and kind of join each other and then we have uh, more for kind of a fun event especially when we're in winter and we're yeah, it's still almost certainly going to be um, in the middle of COVID. So if you want to have a, a nice, a nice evening, watch some cool short films. We have a, this wild and scenic film fest. I think this will be the maybe third or fourth year we're doing that. Um, that is January 13th. So save the date. Um, but uh, excellent. And then, uh, oh yeah, one more thing here. Um, I really, if uh, if you don't know much about the Alliance, um, we really, um, we're getting a lot done. I'm pretty proud to work for the Alliance. Uh, I've been here since 2017 and I'm just more, more and more proud of us every single year. Um, and uh, so we, one of the things we've done recently is, is make this web page to kind of show what we're doing, what we're getting done, how people who are kind of helping, you know, uh, uh, joining us are, are making a difference. And so this allianceforthebay.org uh, slash your impact is kind of a cool site. Um, I actually, there's a, a video, um, we did a tree planting at a, a high school a couple of years ago, and there's a student there who decided to go into um, uh, environmental science because of that experience she had. And there's a video about that on there. And it gave me, I mean, it's giving me, giving me goosebumps just thinking about it now. So yeah, highly recommend it. But thanks so much, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Jo and, and Bob. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I hope to see you both in person pretty soon at some point. So. All right. That's right. Yep. Yeah.